Uh, we were considering religious liberty through the experience uh, of those in the book of Daniel. Remember, we were looking at the book of Daniel. We saw the young men that they protested against the meat that was offered to them. The king had made meat uh, and his people that offered meat uh, to their idols. And then the king had these special men to, he appointed them a certain diet. He appointed them a certain diet and it was to partake of that meat and of the wine of the king. Now the three Hebrew worthies, they denied that diet. Why? Because if they were to eat the king's meat and drink his wine, then they would be paying homage to his gods. And they said, no, that we will not do. We will not pay homage to your God. We will not eat of the king's meat because eating of the king's meat would be to pay homage to his gods. The king, like God, appointed to them a diet. Remember in the beginning, God appointed to man a diet? He appointed to man a diet. You can read that in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, God appointed to man a diet. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, seeking to be like God, appointed them a diet. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar appointed them a diet so that they could be prepared to stand before him. Even so, God has, not even so, but originally, God is the one that has appointed to man a diet. Why? So that man could stand before him. Okay? So diet is very interconnected with our Christian experience. All right? So we're able to see that how they exercise their religious right to reject uh, the enforcement of worship by the king. Yes, that diet was a, a enforcement of a worship by the king. They said, no, you're crossing the line. We will not do that. The second thing is God set Nebuchadnezzar as king. We are able to see that God set Nebuchadnezzar as king and said that everyone has to obey Nebuchadnezzar or else they will suffer. And we saw that same principle um, in Romans chapter 13. When Romans 13, it says that the powers that be are ordained of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Nebuchadnezzar was ordained of God. He was set up by God. He was ordained of God. And anyone who goes against the power ordained of God, they will suffer punishment, we're told in the Bible. We're told that in Romans chapter 13. And it's also said in the book of Jeremiah when it speaks of when God set up Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so God set up Nebuchadnezzar. We also studied how God set up Nebuchadnezzar. We understood how God sets up kings and takes them down. Right. It says that in the book of Daniel, chapter two, we studied how the powers that be are ordained of God. We understood what does it mean that the powers that be are ordained of God? Did God really anoint Nebuchadnezzar? No, he did not. There was no oil involved. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar was a, was a heathen uh, man. He thought he was God on earth. Right. But how did God set him up? How did God appoint him? As the Bible says that uh, that that the powers that be are ordained of God. How did God ordain him? We came to understand that. How God ordains kings and governments and stuff like that is not by choosing them or by uh, adding fake ballots or, or he, he doesn't do that, right? But what it is, how God ordains kingdoms, governments, we came to understand is that we are all created in the image of God. And in God is the principle of temperance. And temperance is the judicious use of that which is wholesome and abstaining from that which is injurious. In other words, temperance is self-control. Temperance is self-control. Self-control is self-government. So inside God is self-government. And we are created in the image of God and in humanity is self-government. We all have the desire to govern ourselves as a society. Now we sin, sadly, and but God has not removed from us the principle of self-government, though we do it in a perverted way. He had not removed from us the principle of self-government. And so that is how God has ordained governments in this world, because he has put in us the principle of self-government, and he allows us to choose whatever kind of government that we want, whether a republic, whether a monarchy, whether a democracy, like a pure democracy, or a, uh, a or a fascist government, or a dictatorship, whatever, God allows us to choose the kind of government it is that we want. He allows us to do so. And whatever it is that we choose, that is what we have to stick with. And he will even work with us through that. He will even work with us through that. So we were able to come to understand all that. You can look at our previous studies to get more detail of how God sets up governments. We went through that, okay? The next is that, uh, so that was point number three. That was point number three, understanding how God ordains powers. Point number four is that the three Hebrew worthies, they went to the plain of Dura, right? Nebuchadnezzar set up the, set up the, uh, the, 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 the image. He set up the image at the plain of Dura. 
and he said that everybody must go to the plain of Dura to worship the image that I made. The music is going to play, and everybody has to bow down and worship. Now, the three Hebrew worthies, uh, Daniel wasn't there. I don't know where he was. He wrote the book, though. He wasn't there. Um, the three Hebrew worthies, they went to the plain of Dura. Did they know that they are supposed to go and worship? Yes, they knew. But did they go? Yes, they went. So they didn't protest. They didn't protest. And the lesson that we learned is that we need to know when we should or should not protest. We need to learn when we should and should not protest. So they didn't protest. They knew that going to the plain of Dora was to worship, but they went to the plain of Dora anyway, but they did not pro and they did not protest. So now they're at the plain of Dura. The music played. Did they bow down? No. That's when they protested. When the law came in, which was infringing upon their right to worship or not to worship. Okay, they, the, 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 the king crossed the line in enforcing worship. They said that we will not do. We will not bow. We are not careful to let you know that if, if God saves us, then good. If he doesn't save us, then, then, then he's still good. We will not bow down. We will not worship your idol, O king. So they came to under, they, they understood everything that we understand. They understood that Nebuchadnezzar was set up by God. They understood the way that that was. They understood that they are to obey the king, but, but, only in civil matters. The king was going outside of his jurisdiction now. He was going into the conscience. He was going into the realm of the conscience. He was going into the realm of faith. And there he has no power. There, he, there is no rule that he can set up. There, there is no rule that he can set up that merits any attention. And those three Hebrew worthies understood that. Their conscience is only for God. Their conscience is only for for God. So in point number five, we came to understand what Christ was talking about in Matthew 22. Well, Matthew, in Matthew 22, Christ said, that which is unto Caesar, give to Caesar, and that which is to God, give unto God. He didn't say give to God through Caesar the things that are God. No. He said, give to God that which is God, and to Caesar that which is Caesar. In other words, separation of church and state. The two must be separate. And then we did a small miscellaneous study where we looked at even the life of Abraham. We saw the separation of church and state. Abraham representing the church, Babylon, Mesopotamia, or of the Chaldees, uh, representing the state. And God called Abraham to leave, to leave his father's house, leave where he was, leave Babylon. And so he separated from Babylon. There was a separation of church and state in the life of Abraham, separation of church and state, right? So, um, but whenever church and state unite, there's always issues. And then we saw in, in the same life of Abraham how he, how he united with Hagar, Hagar symbolizing Egypt because she was Egyptian. Him uniting with Egypt, what did that bring forward? forth? A bond child. And what, did the, and what was the bond child's name? Ishmael. And what did Ishmael do to the child of freedom, to Isaac? Ishmael persecuted the child of freedom. So the union of church and state will bring forth the bond child, the paper, the, 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 the enforcement of the National Sunday Law, which will persecute God's people. We, can, we, we studied all that in, in great detail in previous studies. So if, if you're new with us, then you want to look back at the beginnings of our studies on religious liberty. Okay, because we covered all this in detail, lots of Bible, uh, a lot of Bible quotes on those matters. But I got, I got to go. I got to go because I want to get somewhere with you. So Christ taught the separation of church and state. That which is to God, give to God. God representing the church, religion. And that which is Caesar, give to Caesar. Caesar representing the state the government, okay? Caesar deals with civil matters. God deals with sin. Caesar cannot punish sin. Caesar punishes for civil matters. So those people that go to jail because they killed somebody, they're not going to jail because they committed the sin of killing. They're not going to jail because they broke the moral law. So they're not going to jail due to immorality. They're going to jail due to incivility, okay? They're going to jail due to incivility. Though their incivility is an immoral act, it is not the reason as to why they're going to jail. The reason as to why they're going to jail is due to incivility. So we came to understand the distinction between the two, the two, and we needed the clear distinction between the two. Because if the state can punish sin, well, then what is sin? Well, then what is sin? Then that means that when I dishonor my parents, God forbid, that means that the state can punish me. But you know what makes it even more insane? Is that, you see, God can afford to forgive sin. If I confess my sin to God, 
and the state comes and says, hey, I'm going to bring we're going to bring you to jail because you you broke the moral law. All I have to tell them is, well, well, I already confessed my sins and I'm fully forgiven by God. And so therefore, no jail for me because I've already been forgiven. You see, the state doesn't know the heart. They can only judge the actions. God knows the heart, and that's why only he can judge the heart. So you going out there setting up punishments for people because they did something wrong? You need to stay in your lane. That's not your job. It's not your job to determine what somebody's punishment is going to be because of their sin. They're, whoa, whoa, so hey, don't do that. Don't do that because with the judgment that, that, that oh, with the judgment that you get, you're going to have to meet with that same thing. So that's why, you know, Matthew chapter 7, don't judge yes, lest you be judged. It's talking about condemning people and setting up punishments for them. Don't do that because we are arbitrary. We are arbitrary human beings. It is not our place to set up what judgment somebody is supposed to suffer because of what they have done. Way step away from that. Step away from that. Because imagine if you were judged by yourself. Oh, how about David? You see, that's why these stories are in the Bible, so that we can look at it and so that we can learn. David. When Nathan came to me and said, hey, somebody takes somebody's sheep, a little sheep, they only have one sheep, somebody takes their sheep to go eat, and they have a whole herd and things like that, what do you think should be done to that person? David said, oh, <laughs> he needs to get killed. We need, to, we need to take him out. How's he going to do that? person only has one sheep, you take his sheep. Take him out. Nathan said, you're talking about yourself. You're talking about yourself. Your best friend only had one wife. You have all these women that you're going with that you shouldn't be. You know, you're, talk you're talking about yourself. So let us not condemn one another. Let us not leave that to God. It is for God. Let, let him do that. He'll figure that out. Um, so it's not for the state. It is not for the state to judge and condemn immorality. They are to take care of incivility. So we saw all that. We saw all that. And then point number six is in all this, in all this that we were looking at, we did not neglect to look at the way that God so skillfully and lovingly works with his people, even with the hard-hearted ones. Because the object of the Bible is to really reveal the truth about our God. So all it is that we've been looking at has been revealing to us the truth about our God. And we were observing the way that God was working with King Nebuchadnezzar. It was really a sight to see. It was really exciting to see how God was working with King Nebuchadnezzar. And there are four points it is that we brought together about how God works with his people. About how God works with his people. Four points that we brought together. And I want to share it with you again. Um, last week, I just want to thank uh, Healing of the Lamb Ministry and Sister Melissa for sharing a couple more Spirit of Prophecy quotes that helped bolster um, uh, uh, those four points that we had uh, put together. And we added some Spirit of Prophecy quotes to it. Um, after, you know, having the four points. And then there was one where I, I wanted some more Spirit Prophecy quotes. And I thank, again, Healing of the Land Ministry and, and uh, Sister Melissa for those added quotes. God bless you all. This is, that's what I'm saying. Like, this is such a wonderful, little, nice little community that where I know that if I need something or if I may miss something, I can just ask the brethren and boom, we have it. We're studying together. We're growing and we're learning together. Not everybody has everything. Okay, so we're learning, every, we're learning together as we're going. I'm grateful for that. So these are the four points. The first is that God meets us where we are. God meets us where we are. God meets us where we are. We read that in First Selected Messages, page 22 in Pagai 3, as well as the SDA Bible Commentary, volume 3, page 1143, paragraph 5. So I thank you, Sister Melissa, for that one. I appreciate that. So we see that God meets fallen human beings where they are. Number two, yet he speaks to us in a language that we can understand. We find that in Desire of Ages, page 34, as well as Mount of Blessings, the example in Mount of Blessings, page 45, paragraph 2, with the children of Israel. Next, he leads us no faster than we are able to go. Desire of Ages, chapter 52, the divine shepherd goes through it all. It goes through it all. He leads us no faster than we are able to go. What a, what a gentleman. And the fourth is that he doesn't lead us any further than we are willing to go. He doesn't lead us any further than we are willing to go. Ministry of Healing, page 479, paragraph 2. And Desire of Ages, page 550, paragraph 6. All right. So here, those are the four points there. That God, he will meet us where we are. 
He will speak to us in a language that we can understand. He will lead us no faster than we're able to go. And he'll lead us no further than we are willing to go. 